Retired Sergeant Major Michael Quinn has had an incredible passion for giving back to the veteran community. Spend time um, really thinking about what you want in life, post-military, whatever rank you are, you know, what's important to you, what your values are. Two-time LinkedIn top voice with more than 338,000 followers. I would not be where I am today without the relationships and trust I built at scale on LinkedIn. The reason I'm still in this space is, is the transition. The year of me getting out was the hardest year of my life. Mm. Welcome to Opportunity Accelerators, the show where professionals at any stage of their career can learn how to level up from those that have found success and have the scars to prove it. Our goal for this show is to be sort of a mentorship and perhaps some inspiration in a podcast. But we also touch on other topics in the tech industry, in particular, how we can create more and better pathways to advance tech careers. I'm Vince Verga, and I'm here with my friends, business partners, and the two most fabulous foreigners to ever uh, <laughs> Uh, earn their citizenship to this fine country, Justin Vianello and Joe Mitchell. What's up, Joe? Hey, Vince. Thank you, Vince. Justin, Boston I see you're, the... uh, so you're celebrating St. Yes. Patrick's Day a little bit early. <laughs> uh, I'm basking in the glow of another Rugby World Cup win for the Springboks. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, congratulations on that one. <laughs> thank you. For, for people who don't know what the Springboks are, it's a rugby team. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I just love this how rugby you just team on the planet. <laughs> it's a rugby. A rugby. I love it. The accent is just amazing. Thank so, you. Um, I'd like to introduce our guest. Uh, as a prominent voice in the military to civilian transition space, retired Sergeant Major Michael Quinn led our nation's soldiers for more than 24 years and has had an incredible passion for giving back to the veteran community. Upon retirement from the Army in 2017, Michael entered the private sector, where he is involved in veterans hiring initiatives for companies such as ProSphere and Ernst & Young. He left Ernst & Young to launch Hire Military, where he currently leads the company as its founder and CEO. Hire Military is focused on comprehensive transition and employment connection, support for service members, military spouses, and veterans. His mission is to keep the military community always moving forward to their next career goal. Michael is a multi-year member of the Forbes Coaches Council and a two-time LinkedIn top voice with more than 338,000 followers. So, Michael, first of all, thank you for your service and uh, thank you for being on the show. Welcome. Uh, thank, you. thank you. It's my pleasure. 338,000 followers. That's 338,000 followers more than Joe. <laughs> I mean, it, it's now 350, like 351 or something. It's crazy how sometimes oh, this goes... <laughs> You're gonna so, have to. You're gonna have to give us some uh, some of your secrets there. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I mean, I'm happy to. Honestly, there's no secret sauce. I I literally just have been doing it for six years. Do you, a little do you bit post of time every day? every day for six years. It just it just grows. So you post every day. I do. Where where do you get the inspiration for your content? I, honestly, I just share my life. Like uh, my Eagles. I was at the Eagles Commanders game. Uh, you know. Well, I didn't share the Eagles Cowboys game because Cowboys fans can't handle it, you know. But, <laughs> but they, I was at the Eagles Commanders game and I was on the field. Um, and, I, you know, I shared photos of that. You know, anything that happens in my life, I like to share a mix of personal and professional. Uh, the personal side is just things that I'm passionate about, things I love doing, so people can build a connection. And then the professional side is thoughts about the transition, events I'm attending, events I'm mm -hmm. teaching. Just so people get a snapshot of who I am, what I'm passionate about, and you know what I'm doing, and, and and advice to them that comes from the questions people ask me. So I get I get a question and I'm like, oh, why did they ask that question? And then I'm like, well, that means other people might have that question. Let me share it in a post. And and just over the course of about six years, it's just continued to dramatically grow. And 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 I think I'm I'm lucky in a way that. I've built this reputation that allows me to also be authentic. So I, I can say things that are very blunt because people, they're like, oh, well, that he's a Sergeant Major. And I kind of <laughs> get away with it sometimes. Uh, but for me, that's also the rip the Band-Aid off of the transition. Um, and I know we're going to get into it, but the reason I'm still in this space is, is the transition. The year of me getting out was the hardest year of my life. Mm. Harder than Iraq, harder than Afghanistan, 
I was wading across the Sava River Bridge in Bosnia in 1996. I spent eight months in the Philippines. I spent four to six months total in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Like I've been everywhere overseas and nothing from a pure like stress and, and really fear perspective hit me like the year of my transition. I was scared of what was going to happen after I got out because uh, as a retired sergeant major in a DC area, my retirement pay doesn't go far. Mm. You know, it's too expensive living here. And I had a job that I loved for 24 years and I wanted to find something I enjoyed doing. I didn't want to just find a job. And I didn't know mm. what that was going to be because when I go to a job fair and say, I spent, you know, for six hours, I spent to four to talk to 41 employers. And I said, well, I lead the operations for 17,000 people in 45 countries. And they just look at me like, and like, what job is that out here in the private sector? Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn to translate all of that. And so sure. finding my success, like the struggle to find it and eventually finding it and continuing to grow since I got out is why I'm still so active. I don't want any service member to have to go through what I did if I can prevent it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, obviously you spent 24 years in the, in the military, um, Maybe a good place to start is it talk to us what inspired you to join the military in the first place and, mm -hmm. and maybe talk a little bit about your experience there. This is great. So Top Gun. All right. Um, <laughs> really hilarious. The that was, that was going to be the icebreaker question. What, right? so, what military theme movie inspires you most? <laughs> so Top Gun, the original Top Gun, I saw it. I wear contact lenses and I'm like, I want to be a pilot. So I went and made an appointment with the Air Force recruiter because... I didn't realize it was Navy. I thought they were Air Force jets flying off of Navy carriers. I didn't know the uniform. Nobody in my family had ever served. And so I made an appointment with the Air Force to go talk to them about being a pilot. And the recruiter never showed up. I literally was sitting out front of a closed office. And my Army recruiter, eventual Army recruiter, came out to smoke a cigarette. I don't smoke. Uh, but he's like, hey, what are you doing over there? And I'm like, I'm waiting for an appointment. He's like, they're bowling. I remember this like it was yesterday. <laughs> They're bowling? And, yeah, that's what he said. I mean, they, what is it? Like friendly, friendly competition, whatever. But they never showed up. And so eventually he's like, hey, why don't you just come in and talk to me? And I did. Uh, and, and I went through all the jobs and he said military intelligence. And it really captured my, you know, attention. It sounds like, whoa, I never thought about that. It sounds really cool. You know, James Bond, you know, Mission Impossible, like all these types of things. And uh, one thing led to another, and, and, and the Army gave me uh, exactly what I wanted to join. I was only doing it for five years, uh, and then it was time to get out. And this is really interesting for what you guys do. I was in Korea. I was a Korean linguist, intel guy doing counterintelligence. And I was getting out, and when I started to look at the job market, I realized that there were no jobs that were in, in 98, there were no jobs that were for a counterintelligence guy with no degree, no certifications. Like, and so I looked mm -hmm. at the market and it scared the crap out of me. And so I reenlisted for three more years to finish my degree. 19 years later, I get out. Mm -hmm. um, but funny segue, the Air Force beat the Navy again with Top Gun <laughs> 2. Did you guys see Top Gun 2? Uh, yeah, I saw it. In yeah. the movie theater? Did they mm -hmm. play an Air Force recruiting video before the movie? No, I didn't notice that. Mine had an Air Join the Air Force <laughs> ad right before <laughs> Top Gun 2. And I'm like, oh, smart. they got him again. Smart right? Okay. I said, that's the Air Force is smart. So yeah, it's smart recruiting. And quick quick so, question on that movie. Did you uh, determine what enemy we were actually fighting against? Because that wasn't entirely clear to me. <laughs> the original or the second one? No, the original was pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I have my ideas. <laughs> In well, today's we'll, we'll... world, uh, maybe not the best to make that guess. Yeah, so yeah. I will say it's a funny story. I ask when I, so I teach every general and admiral when they get out of service, every single one of them. I had General Milley, the former chairman of Joint Chief of Staff for three hours. I teach them how to network and use LinkedIn. And um, when I talk to the Air Force admirals, I ask them, hey, when was the last TV show, movie, whatever, that made the military look good? And it used to be, they'd say NCIS. And I said, really? Because everybody on that show is by nature 
a criminal. <laughs> You're literally only investigating Navy crim like that's naval criminal. And they go, oh, and then now they say Top Gun too. And I'm like, do you realize that the Navy was the bad guy and that Maverick actually had to steal a fighter jet to prove it was possible <laughs> to save those lives that the ad the only good admiral died, Iceman. <laughs> And the other admirals were like, just give those eight lives away. We don't care about them. And they all go, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, so, yeah. sorry, I got on a tangent yeah. there. But I'm yeah. all about branding and thinking about, like, how what you say, what you do might impact other people. Well, clearly and at some point we need, to, we need to produce a, a movie that casts the military in a more favorable light. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. It, and it's not the A-team either. Right, <laughs> they were falsely accused. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm right. gonna go through the list. The last that's... one that the last show that was all positive was MacGyver. Ah, okay. Because he didn't use guns. He used his brain, his his pocket knife, some duct tape, whatever. And and that was the, and he was a veteran. Like that yeah. was the last one that I could think of. So, okay. So, Mike, I've got a question for you. you. You mentioned earlier that the transition out of the military was one of the hardest things you've ever done. What was it that was a challenge for the employers when they were, when you were going to these job fairs and they were interviewing you and you were going through this process? Was it your degree? Was it your background? Was it your skills? What made it so hard for you to slot into the right opportunity with these employers? Yeah. Uh, I think there was a disconnect in where I thought I was and what people valued and what employers truly valued. And so when I say that, what I mean is I was the operations sergeant major in a two-star command. And so we had 18 subordinate commands, 17,000 people all over the world. I would travel with the general. You know, when I walked into a room and people saw my rank, you know, not only did I get instant respect, but I was helping to run operations for all over the world. And so when it came time for me to get out, my whole elevator pitch, my whole resume, my whole everything was looking backwards, right? It was, mm. it was mm. I'm a sergeant major, top performer, I'm a leader, I'm a coach mentor, I lead the operations for this massive number. 17,000 people in 45 countries. Uh, my organization has a $330 million annual budget. That, and, and I would list all these big numbers that I was taught to use in the military that I was accustomed to using in the military. And none of it resonated with employers because not only do we not count things the same way, right? In the private sector, you don't count everyone in your company as someone you, you rate or take credit for. You take credit for your direct reports. And the reality is, as an operations sergeant major, looking back, I was an individual contributor. Mm. Doesn't devalue me, but it mm. would have explained what I do more. Uh, that I don't, if you asked me about that 330 million budget back then, it was the budget assigned to my organization. I didn't know what we did with it. Like, <laughs> I went when I needed money. You know, I, I wasn't managing it. I wasn't building business cases. I wasn't contracting it or, or dealing with vendors or any of that stuff. And, and so, I was basically taking for the for the initial portion of my transition, I was taking a rear a rear view mirror look at who I was mm. and, and just taking all these big accomplishments, all these big numbers, all the things I've done in the military and putting it on a two page paper, you know, that what I called a resume and just telling people like this is who I am in the military and I'll go anywhere for the right opportunity. I just want to leave. And the problem is is I was really expecting people to do it for me when I do that. Like, tell me what's available. Send me where you need me to go. Give me an opportunity and I'll excel. And that's a lot of risk to ask employers to accept, mm. right? Like, I'm going to take this person because of the rank, because they sound cool, but they have no practical experience. They don't understand business. And so the hard part for me was when it comes to dealing with employers is, is, you know, I would look at jobs and say, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. But I could never articulate what they were really looking for in those jobs. Like I couldn't say, you know, what the biggest challenges for people in those jobs were or what, 
what they spent the bulk of their time on or what metrics they needed to track to be able to show that they're performing or what the what the the requirements were to get there other than what I read into a job description. Like I really didn't know the jobs enough to say that I wanted to do that or to make myself sound like a best candidate on paper or in person. Mm. Yeah, but I think that doesn't that come down to look what type of role that you you think you might be interested in, right? And then being able to translate the skills that you've learned, whether it's in the past four years, eight years, 30 years in the military, translate them in a way that's meaningful to the employer, right? Yes. So so whether it doesn't matter whether you've been in four years or whether you've been in eight years or 16 years, you know, people coming out of the service, there's always a core set of skills that they will have. Mm -hmm. And then it's, you know, obviously dependent on your role and your rank and what you were doing. Then there's all those additional skills and, and leadership that you've, you've learned mm -hmm. while you're in the military that you then need to figure out how to translate that into the business context. Yes. And I, I will say two things. One, the bulk of those skills are soft skills. So they yep. don't technically show up well on a resume. Like how do you, how do you prove on a resume? How do you quantify on a resume your leadership ability, right? It's a little harder or communication ability or, right. you know, the, the, the never give up attitude or morals or values. So that's one piece. I think the other biggest, the, the other hardest part is, and, and, and I, I teach all the generals, admirals, I teach all over the different levels of services. And what I tell people is like, if you look into your background, there's a pretty good chance examples of that exist of where you've done that because mm -hmm. we're we're such generalists in the military the challenge is is that you have to understand what they're looking for so when i started thinking i wanted to go into hr i'm like great you know i'm i'm all about you know leadership and and building a team and training and 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 then if you think about what your hr people really spend their time on you know, it's benefits and compensation, yeah. compliance, employment, labor law, making sure the company doesn't get sued. Like there's different perspectives there and that's for every job. And so what I tell people is that unless you're going to go the route of like the education certification with a with an organization that's going to work with you and, you know, kind of set you up for success, what you have to do is you've got to do the career exploration. You've got to reach out typically to veterans in those fields and say, hey, I, I noticed you're a veteran. You found success doing X, Y, Z. I'm getting out in a year. You got a few minutes. Just give me some advice. Tell me what you actually do. And, and, and I would even say that I would tell a lot before they sign up for a program like Skillstorm or any of the other vet tech programs, I would tell them like, hey, go talk to some veterans in tech and, and ask them what they do. So you can come to that program eyes wide open, say, I want to do that. And there's much more buy-in. Yeah. Uh, Mike, so, you know, you talked a little bit about some of the skills that somebody might have coming out of the, the military, obviously maybe leadership experience and mm -hmm. tenacity and things like that. If, if you were, you know, talking to somebody that hasn't hired veterans or, or people from the military before, you know, what, what would you tell them they should expect with getting somebody that that's been in the service and, and has served this country? What are the, you know, what are the qualities that they have that, you know, th you think makes them, uh, you know, good employees, good team members. Uh, you know, it's kind of funny. I told you just a minute ago that the soft skills don't show up on a resume, but the soft skills show up in the performance, mm -hmm. right? And, and when you talk about today's world, um, and you talk about you know the different generations and everything else like that, and expectations. What is it, Gen Y, Millennials, Gen Z, all these different you know, types of, uh, of generational people. When you, when you take veterans, that cross cut section of veterans, really you're getting someone with a work ethic, with instilled values, teamwork. Uh, you're getting someone that's used to making stuff happen in the, you know, like if I, we need to get, this is a no fail mission, you know, way more often than not, the veteran's going to figure out a way to get it done, just like they've been doing their whole career. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's really what, what you want when you talk about, you know, bringing veterans into a team. And, and, and I've read somewhere that high performers are 400% more like 400% more productive than an average employee 
And and really what I've seen is that, you know, when you hire the right veteran, I'm not saying it doesn't exist in the non-veterans because like some of the best leaders I've ever worked with are non-veterans as well. But I think that there's a higher percentage that that veteran is going to come in, you know, if they're, if they're brought into the right environment, if they're yeah. given some, some support like veteran employee resource groups and everything else like that, that veteran is going to come in and really uh, succeed and help you build the right team. Yep. Yeah. Now I couldn't agree more. We've got a guy um, who works on our team and in, in the sales team and uh, I, I, he, we've got core values. Uh, one of our core values is tenacity. Mm-hmm. And he's the only person in the company whose name is our core value. So we call him Tenacious Ken, right? Because <laughs> because he is literally, he will find a way or he will make one, right? Yeah. He, is, he will never give up until he's got the job done. He's fantastic. And everybody in the core uh, company refers to him as Tenacious Ken. And he's I don't a think veteran, there's a, honestly. Yeah, and he's a veteran, yeah. So, yeah. so Mike, if, if I'm a service member looking at transitioning out, what, what would you give, what advice would you give in terms of some of the programs that you go through and in terms of what programs they should consider in terms of the most in-demand skills that you see in the market? Oof. That's a tough one. So, you know, I, I would say that the first thing I mean, Congress mandated everybody start the transition no later than 365 days before their separation date, right? So I would probably back that up six months and Mm. I would spend time um, really thinking about what you want in life, post-military, whatever rank you are, you know, what's important to you, what your values are. I'd I'd get on LinkedIn and start networking and talking to other other veterans. There's a couple nonprofits I'm big fans of um, out there. Uh, I would uh, look at uh, American Corporate Partners. They, they pair you with a mentor from a Fortune 500 company for a year. So you get access, if you do it right, to their mentorship. Uh, the USO Transitions team, you know, they give you a transition specialist that works with you. Uh, Hire Here is USA. Um, you know, they're um, going to give you, help you with your resume. They do some career placement, informational interviews, stuff like that. Uh, I would start early with all of those because they're not, not all programs work equally for each individual you have to find the ones that work right with you so i say sign up for them all and stick with what works for you with the idea that you're able to narrow it down before about the nine month mark because i want not every service member is going to be able to do skillbridge but there is no program out there like skillbridge uh, um, you get the opportunity to um you know go full-time for three to four months uh with an employer you know or with a training partner and kind of set yourself up for success. Now, the key to SkillBridge is you have to start early enough and you have to have those conversations with your levels of command, right? Ideally sooner rather than later, so they can get a replacement or you can have your business case, like, hey, you're not using me, These, I'm gonna take this much leave, whatever it is to get into SkillBridge. And so ideally you do the career exploration before you get to the SkillBridge piece out there. Now, when it talks to when it comes to the transition itself and what are, are, are some of the jobs that people should go to, I I am I would like to say this in the nicest way possible. Um I am not on the project manager bandwagon. Um there's this it's probably the most well marketed program I've ever seen to veterans in the world where they have this thing where every service member, if you're like an E5 and above, you're a project manager, go get this certification and we're going to give you this great field. And I'm like, okay, great. What industry? Like, I'm not hiring an IT. Like, if you you say you got, okay, you got your cert and you want to go be an IT project manager, but you have zero experience in IT, like, that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. You don't want to hire me to be your construction project manager. Trust me on this. <laughs> or or your medical administrative or HIPAA or what, like, you know, so I, I'm really stuck on some of these, some of these other programs that, that are this one size fits all, you're a leader, go get a job because you know, as well as I do, there's no job out there titled leader. They're looking for you to do a job and lead, right? And so, you know, I, I really do think that, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on with you guys. I, I really do think that when you look at, the future and you look at opportunity and you look at how our world's become more interconnected, more tech, you look at what AI's done in the last year, 
And, and you really start to see that if you want a meaningful career, you know, moving into the tech sector is a really good way to go. Like you can open up so many doors if you just get that tech experience. And look, if you're not good doing this, but you get the experience doing that, then you could be an IT project manager, right? Because sure. you understand it. Or you could go, go, go into tech sales because you or tech recruiting, right? It opens up doors. But getting that foundational industry experience to me is so important. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so Mike, you know, obviously long career in the military, you come out into the, the civilian world and work for a couple of good companies there. And, uh, and then you become an entrepreneur. So talk to us, what was the inspiration for higher military? How'd you get started? And uh, talk to us about what you guys are up to today. Yep. So I will say, you all know this, being an entrepreneur is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> um, and if it was easy, everyone would do it. Um, so I, I will say I'd been out for about a month and a half and, um, you know, hiring our heroes, another great program out there, uh, opened their first, co first cohort in the DC area and they had 30 slots and they had 90 candidates. And so 30 people got internships or fellowships and 60 people got messages saying, Hey, sorry, you weren't selected. Mm. And so a bunch of them reached out to me and said, Hey, what do I do? And I'm like, go find your own. And they, what do, what do you mean? I'm like, go talk to companies and say, hey, look, I can come do an internship with you for three to four months. You're not allowed to pay me. You want me? You know, and yeah. it should be easy. And they're like, what? Who do I talk to? And then some came back and said, I can't do it. It's an unpaid internship. And I said, well, no, it's not. Here's the DOL opine, you know, and, and the Fair Labor Standard Act. And, all, you know, and so what I realized is that there was a major disconnect. And this is back in January of 2018. There weren't all the skill bridge programs that there are now. And so my first instinct was to create a, a, a platform. So I created the Higher Military Platform. I, uh, one of my colleagues uh, had a cousin that had a software development firm. And you know I was laughing after I got a huge price to build this platform. And he's like, hey, I could do it for you. And so we partnered up. And so the idea of the platform was that companies would list opportunities, service members would make profiles, they'd click on each other, and then if they both agreed that they wanted an internship, we'd process it for a small fee. Uh, and so I took the better part of eight months building that out. We we got our first few kind of clients. We started, you know, was building the brand, attracting people. And what I realized is that recruiters don't want to do that. Like they didn't want to get them yet another platform. They already yeah. had their ATS. They posted all their stuff. And so then we shifted to the, Hey, we're going to find people for you model. Uh, we did that for a while. And then last year realized that Skillbridge was getting very congested and that we were only hitting about 10% of the population. And so we expanded the direct placement temp to perm um, and started doing that. Little did I know that the economy was going to go like this for a while. And everybody's like, oh my God, Skillbridge is an amazing deal. So, you know, we're still doing both. And then I'm a service disabled veteran. Um, at EY, I was a senior manager in our people advisory practice, uh, working on contracts. I, I learned so much about the government space and I realized that there's an opportunity for me to, to expand this into the government contracting world. So you know, our company is a service table veteran owned small business. So we're a, a, a diversity supplier for companies, which is always nice for them. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, we have some contracts right now, talent management. Uh, we work with all the services on, on contracts, talent management, and we're on a bunch of, we have like 35 people on Army Tap right now uh, wow. in transition centers around the country. So it's been uh, just continued growth and opportunity, but I will say a couple things. I still learn every day. Um, I, I didn't have the business case when I got out. I didn't understand business when I got out as a sergeant major. So it's been a, a real struggle. And so I tell every senior enlisted leader that I talk to, sit in every budget and finance. Like I used to run from them. Sit in every single budget and finance meeting that you can so you learn how to talk about numbers, budgets, resources, and yeah. think differently about your resource uh, allocation. And then the other thing is that I would not be where I am today without the relationships and trust I built at scale on LinkedIn. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is what it's how I got to meet you all. Right. I mean, my network is 100 times stronger now than it was when I got out in November 1st, 2017, because I've continued to connect with our community. I've continued to give back, which I will call social capital. It's investing social capital so that 
at some point when you need something and you reach out, it, it's not only an ask. People know who you are. They know you give back to the community. You help other people. And they're more than willing to take it. And that's the same thing for Higher Military. My brand helped launch Higher Military's brand. And then being smart enough to realize that I can sometimes rub people the wrong way with my directness. I hired a social media manager that is a get along with everybody person mm. uh, to run the company page. <laughs> but so, so even if you don't get along with me, there's somebody on my team you love. And, and, and I taught my team how to um, grow their brand, share their love for the company, what they're doing. So, you know, uh, last year, higher military surpassed me in followers. Uh, we have, a, I think we're approaching 500,000 followers uh, over five years or so. Wow. And I will say we have not paid That's a awesome. cent to promote content. It's all organic. That's wow. amazing. Good. It's, all, it's brilliant. Thank you. It's a lot of work, <laughs> but for the right reasons. And so, I think I just got off on a tangent, so. No, yeah. but, but now, look, I, I'm really interested in this. So as an entrepreneur, how many hours have you had to put in every day and every week in oh order to God. get that? Yeah, so this I, is, I was actually this gonna is, ask another question too. Yeah, yeah this, this but, is not a nine till five job, right? So no. how, how, how would you consider you, what does a typical week look like for you? So, so we never, so let me start from the beginning. It, I built the first platform out of savings. Yeah. Like I spent all my savings to build it. Like I have an idea. I love it. I talk to a bunch of people that I trust. They're like, yeah, I think people would buy this. Yeah. And I said, all right, here's all my savings, right? To build the pla all my savings wow. to build a platform. And then I worked and did speaking engagements. And for the first three years, every cent I had that was not for like living went to the company. And I will tell you that I was working 50 hours a week for ProSphere, 50 plus hours a week at EY, and I was working another 40 hours a week on top of that on the company. Wow. So it, my life for three years and all my money mm. went into higher military. And then uh, this is the end of our third year. Uh, I finally, so funny story, EY went to unlimited PTO, which is great. Mm. But they said, you're going to lose all your PTO on one January. And I'm like, wait a minute. I have like two months saved up and I already had the runway. I was already, pl I was planning to stick around to help them win some work. And I was like, I can't just give you two months worth of salary for nothing. And so mm -hmm. I left like right before Christmas, I guess it would be 2019. And then January, 2020 went full time. I had about, a, I had enough workbook business to run me for about a year. Uh, I felt comfortable that's with that great. and I figured if I, me full time couldn't get it, then it wasn't going to happen. And, um, and then I found a business partner that I brought on that I realized had all the business acumen, all the experience, all the operations, all the detail. I was an ideas guy and I was a relationships yeah. guy and she's the, the person that actually knows how to run a business. And, and so I brought her on and, um, you know, it's taken off since then. And, and you ask like there's never a moment that I'm not working really, I, you know, <laughs> three, three years in, I mean, if, if yep. I'm not, I mean, like there are some moments when I'm like, if I'm out doing something with my kids, but like every free moment it is on work sure. and, and, you know, nights I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm, I have an idea. I'm like, I got to work on this. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, if somebody <laughs> yeah. says they want to talk. I got to make that call. You know, it, it's not, you know, like, I, <laughs> Yeah, no. I, like I don't even know how to explain it. Like, there's no nine to five. Like, no. there's no, there's, there's no like work life balance. What like, <laughs> I, I don't even know how to like that doesn't exist, right? But, <laughs> but I think my saving grace is that my work is my passion. Yes. Right. Absolutely. It, they're aligned. So, so I find that work life balance some yeah. way. Like, I, I love what I do most of the yeah. time. And so, you know, it, it kind of all comes together and I find whatever balance works for me. Yeah, that's awesome. And if you're passionate about it, it doesn't feel like work, right? Right. So, right. And, it, and yeah. it's growing up. I, I think there's, uh, but to your point, Mike, I don't think people often realize the sacrifice that has to be made, right? When you essentially working two jobs, you're putting your life savings into something, um, you know, that's a sacrifice that is made. And, and luckily you've been able to make a success out of it. And so it's a great story. 
So what does the future have in hold for higher military? What's, what's your vision for the future and what would you like to, to see for the company? Uh, you know, obviously I want to continue to grow. Um, you know, this was a, this year was a transformational opportunity getting on the, the army transition assistance program contract. Um, you know, getting the opportunity to have members of our team that are in the transition centers around the country, just for the army right now was, um, really, an, it's an incredible opportunity because, uh, you know, it's an investment by our company, but I will say that we have the opportunity to give them resources, treat them well, you know, help them grow so that they can help soldiers grow, you know, and, and transition better. So I'm really excited about that. You know, I've been I've been working with Congress a bit. I've been over to Congress four times in the last year to talk about uh, speaking to the House Veteran Affairs Committee, but talking about the things that they need to do to make to continue to improve the transition assistance program as a whole. And And, and it's I don't want to say like it's a horrible program. I mean, it's improved so much over the last six years and so many people get, you know, great training, but it's not enough and, and, and we can always improve. So I want to get a little more involved in that. I will tell you that um, I, I want to get involved in all the transition programs for all the services. So uh, and, and see how we can start to to teach people how to leverage this platform and, and, and really own their transition, give them the tools give them a little bit of motivation to use them because the transition doesn't happen magically. Uh, and, and so that's from the government contracting world. And then, you know, really just focus on expanding higher military. You, one of the things I'm most proud of is that over the last year, not only did we have a 97% job offer rate uh, at the completion of internships, no fuzzy math, mm -hmm. like 97% of our interns spend three to four months with an employer full-time and they get a job offer from that employer. Wow, um, that's fabulous. Not only do we have that, and, and a big part of that is because we're picking the right employers. We make sure they have headcount um, you know, before they go in. The service member's working on a member of a team doing the job that they're going to do or that they want to do, and, and the company gets a chance to really assess them. So uh, we have that, um, but also 97% of our direct placements stayed longer than a year. So I'm really you know, excited to start to expand what we're doing with higher military with employers around the country. Uh, you know, we're doing some uh, talent management stuff with Cyber Command. So we have a lot of clear tech talent that mm. we want to start, you know, expanding on. We're doing a lot of work with the different services. So, I mean, it's really just, you know, honest to God, it's, I have so many ideas mm. <laughs> that I can't stop. Like I just see opportunity in everything and, and my team has to be like, hold on, let's finish these other ones first. So I have to keep a log of all these opportunities, but I, I really just want to continue to, to innovate, you know, partner with the right organizations. Cause it's not something we can do together, do on our own. Uh, our world is becoming so interconnected and just make the, make the world and make our community a better place. And, and you know what? I'm not a nonprofit and, right. and I want to make money doing that. Like, and I'm not ashamed to say that, right? No. I think the veteran community says has this nonprofit versus for profit argument. And I'm like, you do realize that nonprofits are businesses too, that they need revenue, they need to sell something, you yeah. know, you know, there's some that are making a lot of money, you know. So I, I, I wanna somebody told me what did they they said they wanted to be I can't remember something like uh they wanted, to, they wanted to make the world a better place and make money. Yeah. And they had a great word for it. And, yeah, and, and I really, think the one I've heard a lot, Mike, is do well by doing good. Yeah. Right? That's do it. well but, by doing good. Revenue doesn't but, define but, you, but it sustains you. Right? Right. But also, if, if, if the outcome is great for the, the veteran or transitioning service member, does it really matter? Right? right? If it's a great experience and a great outcome, does it really matter whether they're a, they're a profit or non-for-profit? And so, you know, I think that's important. Yeah, I think my, my one thing I, is that um, I don't, none of my services charge the service member, right? When it comes to transitioning service members, we find other ways to pay for it. You know, whether it's, you know, we have our, our, our digital network and professional program. We, we worked with Army Ignited to get that funded by the Army. Uh, whether it's our services, the company pay us, you know, for the placements or whatever, you know, I, I, I'm really a big fan of trying to find ways. I, and, and I don't, 
I don't judge companies that have to charge for their services because I think there's something to be said when somebody pays for something. They they typically will put more, forth more effort. Mm. But I like I think there's enough resources out there that most of what we want to accomplish can be done getting funded by other programs. Right. Yep. So um so Mike, uh you had mentioned um you know you're you're working with all these veterans on these different uh programs. Can you Talk to us, you know, what would the, what would the journey be like for one of these, you know, service members? What could they expect if they were, you know, working with you and, and trying to break into the, to the private sector? What's that like? Yeah. You know, there, there's a couple of different things. So for me, I, I do, you know, monthly webinars free to everyone uh, on how to use LinkedIn, how to grow your network, you know, how to engage with professionals, figure out what you want to do. I post every day. There's always tips on things that are transition related. So there's no reason to go into it, you know, not knowing what to expect. Now, when it comes to higher military, what I'll share is that every one of our recruiters are either veterans or military spouses. So mm -hmm. they've been there. They've been in the shoes. They understand our community. They, they um, you know, our, our, our partnerships manager is a military spouse. You know, our account manager is a veteran. You know, so our, our company is built up of people that have been there. So. You know, when when service members come to our company, they can join our talent network. Uh, when veterans come or military spouses, they come, they can join our talent network for jobs. So we have one for SkillBridge and we have one for jobs. Um, but when when they come to us, what they can expect is, you know, in really honest engagement from our recruiters. We post the salary for every job that we have. It gets posted on our website. I know we don't have to, but we want to be open about all of that. They're going to work with service members to, to you know, uh, get their, their resume in shape. They're going to prep them for their interviews. They're going to help them, you know, figure out what, what's a good fit for them and, and be honest when it's not a great fit, right, on certain roles. And, and what we're always going to do is make the best decision for the service member and the company. So there's no square pegs in a round hole, mm -hmm. right? Um, I know there's a lot of other uh, recruiting companies or staffing companies out there that, that are, you know, let's throw spaghetti against the wall and take what fits, you know, see what sticks. That is yeah. not us. We're yeah. really focused on retention, the right fit. Uh, and my team knows that, you know, it's not throw anybody against this rack. It's about, let's make sure it's the right fit for both sides. And so really that's what I would say. And it's the same for our employer partners. You know, our employer partners get the same kind of consideration. You know, we have employer partners come to us and say, we want you know, 500 people that do X, Y, Z. And, and I would love to say that we can do that. I would love to say we could do that, <laughs> but we're not a high volume staffing company. You know, we're not, you know, that's not how we work. We're a, you know, let's get you the right fit for your opportunities. Let's work together to, to get you as many as you can and know that the ones we give you, we put our name behind it. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's who we are. Well, you've built a, a fantastic, uh, company, Mike, um, you know, really, uh, incredible story. You know, the, the passion for what you do is, is apparent. Um, and you know, it's obviously incredibly, incredibly important work. And so, you know, thank you for all you're, you're doing for, for veterans. Um, very much appreciated. And, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're certainly happy to be working with you as well. So before we sign off here, it is time for the famous lightning round. Justin Vianello, hey, take it away. Hey, God. Are you ready? Uh, I, so I just want to caveat that I am. Very rarely do I caveat that I am a retired Sergeant Major. But if you're going to do rapid fire, just understand. <laughs> if we're going to do we this like the right it. way, be careful what you ask for. Yeah, that's <laughs> how we like it. All right, you're ready. Here we go. First question. What book are you currently reading? Actually, I just finished Will White, uh, Waybound. What's the best piece of advice you ever received? Can I pass? Yes, you can. <laughs> you could... Come on. Come back to that at the end. We'll come back to that. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? So, ah, so mm -hmm. hard. I... Mm -hmm. Here, not not Liverpool. Good. I would say no to but, Liverpool. But that's I would for sure. say that one, if I <laughs> couldn't live places. here in the United States, uh, I loved Scotland. Okay, I, I hate. Yes. I really enjoy. <laughs> Sorry, I like. Joe's I neck a of the couple woods. weeks there. I love it. And it blew I, my mind. Okay, go, keep going. What's your go-to comfort food? <laughs> soft pretzels, Philadelphia soft pretzels, not Auntie Annie's. <laughs> <laughs> what hobby or interest 
do you have that most people don't know about? Uh, aside from the Philadelphia Eagles, um, cycling. Mm -hmm. What's one trend you wish would make a comeback? Bald heads. <laughs> <laughs> if you could have any superpower, what would it be? In teleportation. What's the best concert you've ever attended? Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails, oh. in a small bar in Frankfurt, Germany, and it wasn't a concert. They said, we'll play, we'll play for beer. Oh, that's wow. awesome. That's a good <laughs> one. If you're stranded on a desert island and you could only bring one thing, what would it be? Uh, osmosis machine. <laughs> <laughs> Drink the water. I don't know. <laughs> what's, what's the most challenging task you've ever undertaken? Starting a business. Who's been the most influential person in your life? I, I, I don't have one. There's community. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say veterans because of, of how we support one another. And I know it's longer than five but I couldn't narrow it down to one person. Okay. What's the one that thing counts. you want to achieve in the next five years? Five-time business growth. If you could change one thing in the world, what would it be? I, people could disagree and still get along. Is Bigfoot real? <laughs> you haven't seen my feet. So, <laughs> <laughs> If you could have dinner with one person dead or alive, who would it be and why? My dad. Yeah, he passed over 10 years ago. All right. All best right. Piece, I'm going to come back to the question you skipped. What is the best piece of advice you ever received? Um, your network is your net worth. Yeah, there you, you go. go. Well, for, you I got, hold on. I got one more question. We were talking about movies, and maybe we should make a, uh, a, a great new military theme movie starring Mike Quinn. Mike, who would play you in the movie? Uh, man, uh, you know, uh, maybe Jean-Luc Picard. All right. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever his real name is. Let's go with Picard and let's yeah. close by saying, uh, well, he doesn't say may the force be with you. What does he say? No. Engage. Engage. <laughs> Engage. <laughs> well, this is a very awesome. engaging conversation. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Before we wrap up, can you please tell everybody how to get a, get a hold of you? Yeah, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Just look for Michael Quinn, and I should be one of the top results to pop up. Uh, so you can follow me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm close to the 30,000 limit, so I can't accept so many connection requests. And you could check us all out at HireMilitary.us. Excellent. Well, thank Fantastic. you, everybody, for listening, and we'll catch you next time on Opportunity Accelerators. This episode of Opportunity Accelerators has been brought to you by Skillstorm, where our purpose as an organization is to launch and accelerate tech careers. Please be sure to like and subscribe to catch the next episode.